Good morning. Would like you to uh, have a seat, please. Good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, Future Network Car 2019 edition. My name is Bilal Jamusi. I'm uh, chief of the study groups department in ITU, and I'm here with my colleague. Um, Walter Nissler, I am chief of section for vehicle regulations at United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, UNEC. Thank you. I believe this is the seventh edition of a joint uh, ITU UNECE uh, future network car. Uh, we're very happy to have you here today with us and uh, would like to start uh, our uh, opening session with a keynote speech by Mr. Jean Tot, the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Road Safety and the President of FIA, FIA. Please help me welcome Mr. Jean Tot. Good morning, thank you. Dear Olga Algayerova, Executive Secretary of uh, UNEC, dear Ulin Zhao, ITU Secretary General, dear friends, good morning. And um, it's a kind of a credit tradition for me to open this uh, symposium on the future networked car which uh, thanks to both uh, organizations, the UNEC and the ITU, who are organizing now this event, uh, also taking the opportunity of the Geneva Motor Show. And a few years ago, the debate was whether automation would uh, happen. And it has rapidly transitioned to a conversation about when and how it will happen. A recent study by the IRU revealed that transport companies, for example, are extremely optimistic about the time scales for automation. According to the study, 76% of transport companies expect autonomous trucks to become viable options within the next decade. Of this, nearly 30% believe they will be a reality on our roads in the next five years. Much of the innovation and technologies that we are discussing today have the potential to change and redefine our future transportation systems for the better. The benefits that these technologies can deliver in terms of safety, environmental performance and congestions are so important that we cannot miss this target because of undercooked solutions and actions. I would like to highlight three important considerations in our journey towards autonomous and intelligent transport systems that are safe, secure, and sustainable options on our roads. First, the importance of prioritizing safety. The promise that technology will provide a way of leapfrogging the ever worsening global road safety crisis is appealing and certainly well suited for our human nature. Over the past years, we have observed that there is a global tragedy around the world for the suffering and loss caused by road traffic crashes. Despite worldwide effort during the decade of actions, results have now led to the decrease in the global road fatalities that we were hoping. The 2018 Global Status Report on Road Safety shows that actually the total number increased. We currently stand at 1.35 million road deaths each year, which means one person dies on the roads every 24 seconds. Our imagination is filled with the images of cities buzzing with autonomous vehicles. However, when we consider the work, for instance, on developing international regulations related to safety for automated transport ne networks, the reality is that there is still much more that we need to do. We need to ensure that these promising tools do not themselves become part of the problems. Too early deployment of the advanced technologies and early failures will jeopardize the chance to get the best of the technology in a timely manner creating trust deficit and lack of acceptance. 
We have seen some examples in the recent months and years. Furthermore, these developments should not exclude those most in, those most in need, mainly, namely low and middle income countries and vulnerable groups. How will pedestrian, cyclist, children, and the disabled be protected in the era of self-driving vehicles? While we talk about automation here, there are many citizens around the world that do not have vehicles with basic safety features, like simply seat belts, ABS, or electronic stability control. This is where it is obvious that contribution from the industry is absolutely necessary. This brings me to my second point, which is the importance of industry cooperations and partnership. There are many elements at play which require wide-scale industry cooperation. One example is when we think about how we will facilitate all the sensors to be placed on sidewalks, street lights, and road infrastructure so that there is proper communication with the vehicles. To address concerns about vehicle connectivity, there is talk about increasing the number of sensors to track everything from powertrain performance and operational statistics to geolocation, information, and occupants' wellness. This is also where data cybersecurity is a concern, and some of these types of data collections are not getting a full endorsement from the consumers. We need solutions which are acceptable and affordable to people and to local authorities in the long term, as well as compatible with an economic growth agenda. Large scale deployment, once we have everything in order, will allow for easier transfer of innovation in developing countries. This is where innovations are crucial to reach sustainability goals, as mentioned earlier. We need all stakeholders to hold this common vision. My final point is about the future of mobility and transport, as well as the potential benefits it can have on our society and planet at large. One of the possible benefits of automation is a reduction in congestion and a positive externality to the environment. However, if self-driving private cars become the new norm with the same average occupancy rate that we have today from 1.2 to 1.5 percent per vehicle, we will see a reduction in congestions and carbon emissions. While we develop these technologies, we must in parallel develop a culture of sustainable means of mobility among the public. This means investing in transport networks that promotes use of non-motorized modes, mass transit, and ride sharing. For example, if occupancy rates are doubled to just 2.4 passengers, the same level of mobility could be delivered with only a fraction of today's vehicles, especially if complemented by demand driven public transport. Think about the impact that we could make on improving safety, environmental performance, and efficiency from this shift. I believe that the time, the promise of that is time for promising automation and can be translated into reality and help us towards a more sustainable future. I thank again my friend from UNEC and ITU for their strong contribution to this effort and to all in the room here today for your passion and endorsing those new technologies. And I wish you a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chantad. And uh, now I'd like to invite uh, His Excellency Holin Zhao, Secretary General of the ITU, to provide his opening remarks. Dear Jia, President uh, FIA, and uh, my dear colleague uh, Olga, uh, Executive uh, Director of uh, UNECG, dear colleagues, good morning. I'm very pleased to see you all here. Uh, maybe for Olga's benefit, let me give you some uh, history. Actually, this workshop was created by me more than 15 years ago 
when I was director of standardization bureau. At that moment, uh, ITU worked with uh, ISO IEC for the intelligent transport system, ITS. Then we noted that uh, uh, there's a benefit for us to organize uh, some event uh, associated with uh, motor, motor show in Geneva. And then we talked with uh, Public Sport to see if they can give us a chance. And we also noted that the IS, ISO, IEC, and ITU realized that we have to invite our car industry to join us. Then we started to, to organize this event, just uh, associate back, back with uh, Geneva Motor Show. So I, I'm very pleased to see that this initiative, although almost uh, 15 years long, uh, still continued. And this time it's the TSP director, the Chesap Lee, together with the Yang ECE to organize that one. Uh, actually, I was a TSP director between 1999 and 2006. And after 2006, it's my colleague, uh, Mr. Malcolm Johnson. So between uh, Chesap Lee and uh, myself, we have another director. But uh, all those three directors uh, managed this issue. I'm very pleased to see that this. Uh, uh, event uh, continues. It's uh, absolutely important. And also another uh, small story I'd like to share with you. Our chairman of uh, FIA, uh, Jen, is a specialized uh, uh, specialized uh, envoy nominated by our Secretary General of the United Nations. I think it was done in 2014, something like that. But actually 2013, ITU awarded her him as a champion for our World Telecom Information Society Day. And every year we celebrate our birthday, 17th of May. And each year we try to award some individuals and we consider that uh, uh, rural safety is very important mm -hmm. and ICT could contribute a lot. Therefore, we nominated him as uh, that year's uh, laureate for WTISD. And fortunately, we noted that uh, Quickly afterwards, uh, he was nominated uh, by United Nations General uh, Secretary General as uh, his specialized uh, envoy for rural safety. And since then, we got a lot of uh, support from Jane that he came to our workshop several times. So this time, today he's very busy and he agreed to join us at the beginning of this uh, workshop. Uh, basically for his uh, uh, time, uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, we advanced our workshop uh, from 9.30 to 9 o'clock. Uh, Why I just told him, in the past, when I came here, the room was full, and then the, the, even the corridors are full of people, and today it's a little bit earlier. But anyhow, uh, we are very pleased John joined us uh, to give us a very good uh, message. I, I, uh, you know that uh, the reason why we awarded him 2013 uh, was three purpose. The, of course, the first and most important is to appreciate much his contributions to the rural safety and his influences in the world for the rural safety. And second, we'd like to show the public that the ITU would like to contribute to this event, to this uh, uh, initiative. And ICT can do a lot, and ITU can mobilize ICT industries to contribute to that one. And a third, I would like to also take uh, his uh, uh, personality and his uh, uh, personal achievement to be a uh, flag to have uh, international corporations invite all the partners concerned to contribute, uh, as he just uh, highlighted in one of his messages. So I think that we are quite uh, lucky to have him with us uh, since then. And uh, of course, we look forward to good uh, cooperation with him in the future as well. So working in partnership for already for more than 10 years, that uh, ITU and UNEC have uh, built a productive uh, dialogue between our respective communities. Uh, I just told my colleague, I saw Olga more than I saw my elected colleagues over the last two weeks. And I was with, uh, with her last week at uh, WHO for the uh, United Nations Initiative for the Rural Safety for the UN systems and uh, personnel, personnel. And uh, Olga and me were in uh, WHO headquarters. And Jiang, I know that you were in New York that day. I saw you from New York. Oh, you saw me? 
Oh, unfortunately, we did not see you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, you, you can see that we all worked there very closely uh, together. So I, I think that uh, Olga will give us uh, more information how regulators are thinking about uh, the future of uh, mobility. I'd like to uh, thank our uh, generous uh, sponsors, uh, Tecra, uh, Rubot and uh, Qualcomm. Your support to this uh, symposium is uh, highly appreciated. The automotive uh, industry is undergoing uh, unprecedented transformation. New technologies are at the heart of this uh, transformation. And uh, considering the approach of uh, 5G, and ITU, as you know, we uh, have uh, biggest uh, conference later this year. It's called the World Radio Conference. Every four years, we organize this one. And the previous one was held in 2015 in Geneva. And uh, this year, exceptionally, we will have our a conference in Shiamashink of Egypt uh, since the end, I think at the end of uh, October, just up to the end of uh, November. And we will expect, uh, we expect to have around 3,600 experts and, and, and uh, uh, government representatives and uh, industries to come to uh, Shiamashink to discuss about the 5G and uh, other uh, spectrum related uh, important issues. So the 5G will be further supported by this uh, conference decisions. So that will change a lot uh, in our future. And also some other important development like uh, the massive scale Internet of Things. So ITU's technology standardization work is more relevant to the automotive uh, industries than ever. And that is why automotive uh, industry players such as uh, Volkswagen, uh, Hyundai, China's uh, telematics uh, industry application alliance, Bush, Blackberry, Tata Communications, and the Mitsubishi Electric uh, have joined ITU very recently. By joining the ITU's uh, activities, they are helping to shape international standards that uh, protect and uh, encourage key investment, improve road safety, and help build uh, intelligent uh, transport systems, of course, also for the autonomous driving technologies. The IT standardization platform for many years central to building trust in the ICT sector is now helping the ICT sector to build trust with its many new partners. We see this in areas such as energy, healthcare, financial services, and of course, transport. ITU addresses the intelligent transport in our standardization work for radio communications, security, multimedia, and performance, and the quality of service and rural safety. The future of uh, mobility will be crafted in collaboration by the public and the private sectors, the automotive and the ICT industries and their respective uh, regulators, and the many new market segment emerging at the intersection of uh, vehicles and ICT. Open inclusive standardization process will help these partners to move forward on a basis of uh, mutual trust. So ladies and gentlemen, this uh, symposium will offer ITU future guidance as to how we could best support the automotive uh, industry in achieving its ICT ambitions. I would like to thank our program steering committee for arranging an excellent uh, lineup of uh, speakers. We are also fortunate to welcome a diverse expert uh, audience. We can look forward to highly interactive uh, discussions today. So I thank you all of your participation and wish you a most uh, enjoyable symposium. The last word, last night I cut by half my speech. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Sau. Uh, as the next speaker, I would like to invite Her Excellency uh, Olga Algarova, uh, Executive Secretary and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Distinguished Secretary General, Special Envoy, dear Jean, distinguished ITU Secretary General, dear Hulin, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you, and uh, I hope you all will agree with me that we leave the times of uh, great challenges of uh, very fast technological development. The proof of it we could see with the race car downstairs, but I was astonished by, I didn't see it, something like that before. So, and of course it relates also to the area of uh, mobility of persons, of transport of goods. So if you allow me, let us travel together for a short moment to the future, how the mobility and transport might look like in future, what, what's the vision of that? Imagine passengers taken by driverless cars to their destinations, children driven by automated vehicles to and from school, safe and individual mobility for elderly and those with disabilities, goods delivered to our houses by autonomous pods, Platons of trucks without drivers moving cargo across countries. And all of this is happening without significant accidents and injuries, without traffic congestions, with minimal pollution. So in other words, in, it's a safe, secure, and environmentally friendly vision. So and it is also a picture of sustainable transport as at its best. So you may ask, how do we achieve such a vision? Technology definitely will advance and we need to harness it to satisfy the, the needs of our societies. Among the most fundamental needs, they are safety, security, and environmental preservation. Governments around the world discuss this topic when they gathered at the UN in February for the annual session of the UNEC's Inland Transport Committee, aiming to capitalize on the potential of automation in inland transport to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Ministers and vice ministers of transport and representatives of 31 countries adopted a resolution on enhancing cooperation, harmonization, and integration in the era of transport automation. The resolution itself enshrines the commitment of countries to ensure that the accelerated pace of innovation in transport automation and digitalization will be characterized by harmonization and interoperability, as well as the highest level of safety environmental sustainability, equal access, and the enhanced integration of multiple modes of mobility. So how can we meet all these goals? The key is that all of us, academia, private sector, governments, international organizations, collaborate on developing and facilitating this vision of future sustainable transport. We have to work together towards the same goal and break the silos. Such collaboration already exists in the UN system. There is a long-lasting and well-established cooperation between the International Telecommunication Union. Even you have heard Hulin told that he meets me more frequently than his colleagues. And of course, between ITU and the UN Economic Commission for Europe or UNEC. This cooperation already today bears many fruits, for example, even today, but even more importantly, is our daily cooperation 
UNEC hosts the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations, the famous Working Party 29, which is a unique body for setting a global regulatory framework for the certification of vehicles, their parts, systems, and components. Last year, Working Party 29 established a new working party on automated or autonomous and connected vehicles. Therein, we work not only with governments, industry, academia, and NGOs, but also benefit from the rich expertise of ITU representatives. Our cooperation has already achieved results on cybersecurity and over the year -er software updates, building a new annex of the consolidated resolution on the construction of vehicles, so-called RE3. Another example could be the UN Regulation 144 on ecosystems, the first UN regulation that covers the connectivity of cars. This makes an ITU standard compulsory for vehicle approval. By working together, by exchanging information in an open and transparent way, by supplementing each other's expertise, by creating a level playing field for all involved, we can build a modern, effective and harmonized regulatory framework. This is needed to make connected vehicles safe, secure, consistent with traffic rules, interoperable across borders and compatible with infrastructure. Such a cooperation is not optional. It is in fact imperative. We may not reach our vision unless there is coordinated cooperation among all stakeholders. All the more, I look forward to working with all of you. My last comment would be there are so few women in the room, so I believe that the innovation and technological advances must be also a women issue. Thank you for so much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Olga, Excellency. Um, thank you all for our uh, opening uh, panel. Um, please, uh, let's give them another round of applause to thank them. And now I'd like to invite our first panel, uh, session one, uh, which will be chaired and moderated by Mr. Russ Shields, the chair of uh, YGOMI. So Russ, I'd like to invite you to the stage and uh, perhaps you can invite your speakers. So uh, Joannes Springer, Theodore, Dino, on. Marjorie, Eddie, Andre, Michael, please come to the stage. Thank you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no presentation, Sifani. There's no presentation. Um, but we want to put, um, give me a second. The name for us. All right. Um, I'm very pleased to see this audience. Um, most of the rest of today is going to be working from this side. So those of you who are sitting over on the other side may want to move over. Um, fortunately, we were able to get a bigger room this year than previous years since we were standing only um, in the, the previous room. Um, we are trying to do something I think relatively unique in uh, events. The program committee spent a lot of time and decided that what we really would like to try is much more um, open discussion, audience interaction. So we set these up as long panels. This is scheduled for an hour and 40 minutes um, with eight participants, and we really want it to be um, discussions as the audience um, would like to hear. So it's a guess to do this. I've never 
tried it before in any of the things I so what we will do is we'll have five minutes um, for each of the panelists to say whatever they want add another 30 seconds for them to introduce do themselves because I'm not going to try to um, go through everybody I apologize that I will mispronounce names since I'm an American who knows nothing about languages and screws things up all the time um, just quickly, my background is chair. I am chair of the ITU Collaboration and ITS Communication Standards. Um, as was mentioned, um, one of the key things is the interaction with um, UNECE and WP29, the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations, and I'm one of the ITU um, participants in that activity, which is getting me to Geneva. A lot more than I ever expected, but um, we have to get the regulations right for connected and automated vehicles, and it's a tremendously Im important part. And the last um, panel today is put together by the WP29 participants to give you a better understanding, I hope, of what's being done there. Uh, this session is talking about V2X and where we go. Um, partially, I'm here because I'm the guy 20 years ago when we first got the 5.9 gigahertz allocation from the FCC in the U.S., who decided that we really needed a TDD OFDM approach for vehicle communications. And at that time, 802.11a was literally the only OFDM TDD standard that existed in the communications world. So we said we would use that for testing. And since we needed to test something, said, well, let's go try a here I am message um, so that we could test the protocol. We're now 20 years later and what we're gonna do, I don't know. So um, let's hear the discussion. So Johannes, I'll let you start. Yeah, thanks, <coughs> thanks Russell. Short personal introduction, I'm uh, Johannes Springer. I'm working for Deutsche Telekom uh, Group uh, and responsible there for the 5G automotive program uh, inside um, Deutsche Telekom. And uh, I'm also uh, the Director General of the 5G Automotive Association and that is my uh, today's job to represent uh, that uh, 5G Automotive Association. A uh, very brief description of the 5G Automotive Association was formed <coughs> three years ago, consists of about 110 members, mainly consisting of um, uh, the car manufacturers um, around the globe. It's a global organization um, with the first tier suppliers of the car industry, um, the uh, major tech companies who are providing technology for the equipment in the car, but also for telecommunications purposes like Intel, for instance, and uh, Samsung, Qualcomm, and others. And um, the uh, suppliers of the telecommunication industry and uh, the operators of uh, mobile networks around the globe. So <clears throat> these are 110 members um, formed three years ago, very um, intensively working in different working groups on several aspects around <coughs> cellular vehicle to X and uh, what we can do to, um, to increase the usage of these technologies into the system. So <laughs> with regard to the five minutes, I want to make two statements and um, which are important from my perspective. <clears throat> so the first statement is around, let's say, a common sense, a common agreement, and that was also written in the program. And that common agreement in the industry is from our perspective that cellular networks play a very important role when it comes to efficient and safe transportation in general. So not only with regard to cars, but also with regard to other transportation means. And the usage of cellular networks for several purposes <clears throat> and the common agreement that every vehicle, every new vehicle will be equipped with uh, cellular technology for several purposes, but also for safety. That common agreement is from my perspective, it is a pity that we are not using the full power of that technology, especially for safety. <clears throat> we have a lot of information which is right now available in transportation networks. 
which could be used for several purposes, but it is not used on, on a broad scale. And we, we should discuss about why is that happen, that this kind of information is not used widely for, for several purposes. And one of the, one of the, um, one of the, uh, one of the reasons I believe is that we are focusing, especially if it comes to safety, we are focusing very quickly to exactly that technology, what you have mentioned, Russell, in your introduction, and that is a peer-to-peer -peer communication. We always think that safety only is only relevant if we are uh, making a, a direct communication between communication partners. And that is not true. We have a lot of safety examples which are today used um, in some cars, at some car manufacturers, but not, as I said, on a widely scale, where safety-related information can play an important role, but it is not used. So let us discuss how to, also from a political area, we can increase the speed of using this kind of information, traffic jam information, hazard warnings which are on the road, um, the signal phase and time, uh, which is uh, which is there, which can uh, play an important role transmitted by uh, via cellular information. How to use this in a broader scale in the vehicles? Because there is a common sense that every new vehicle and also other traffic participants are equipped with cellular connectivity already today. So that's the first point. The second point is, how can we? bring the whole ecosystem forward when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer communication. I think that is very important, Russell, um, uh, when, 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 you are, when we are looking back into the past, 20 years, uh, 20 years back, and I can remember very, very uh, nicely on, on an on a ITS World Congress in Vienna 20, uh, 2012, where we sat together on a panel, and you, from, your, from your perspective came the first have a deeper look into the 3GPP ecosystem when it comes to release 12 um, and, and the direct, uh, direct communication means. And right now we have a big, uh, let's say, a big fight in the industry. What is the right technology for peer-to-peer -peer communication? We have cellular vehicle to X on the one hand side and we have Wi-Fi uh, 11P DSRC on the other hand side. And they are doing more or less both, both the same. And the question is, how can we bring an ecosystem forward if we have this kind of disagreement, and that is a clear disagreement in the industry, how we can bring forward an ecosystem if there is a clear disagreement between the major players? And by the way, that is not a disagreement between industries. Because the telco industry has a very clear view with regard to CV2X, it is a it is a disagreement within the uh, within the road operator, but also within the car manufacturer industry. And the question is how we can bring an ecosystem forward if we have this kind of big disagreement between technologies. And from a 5GA perspective, we have a very clear perspective on that, and that perspective is let the market decide. Let, uh, let the forces in the market, the customer benefits, the benefits for, for the society, the benefits for the road operators, let these benefits decide what is the right technology and what is the right direction where we should go. And that is the second point I would like to point out in that, in that discussion, yeah? how to bring an ecosystem forward if we have a very clear disagreement in the industry, how to go. And, what direction we have to go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, second, no no applause. This is a working session. Um, Theodore, um, you want to go ahead? Yes. No? Is it working now? No. Let's take the other one and just work. Is this one working? Yeah. Yes. So again, um, thank you, Johannes, for um, the words. I think this discussion, it's something we had in a lot of different forums, and I was um, very pleased when Russell contacted me and said, 
Victor or you're a guy also supporting DSRC or 11P, please come to the panel and tell us um, how do you see the world. But before going to this question, maybe a couple of words about me. I'm with the Volkswagen um, brand with Volkswagen Group in Wolfsburg. And uh, there I'm responsible for integrated wireless technologies into um, the connected vehicles and basically providing solutions which we can build in our future vehicles and vehicles which are going to come on the market. And my biggest challenge is always getting the right technology for the right problem. And currently we are incorporating a lot of technologies inside our connectivity solutions. We have Bluetooth solutions, we've had Wi-Fi solutions, and we also have a lot of cellular solutions. And the biggest challenge is getting all of them to work together and using them in the most optimal way. And when it comes to the question of uh, V2X or V2X communication, um, we are currently as a Volkswagen supporting the um, DSRC. It's a technology we are also planning on putting on the market this year in one of our um, in the biggest volume um, vehicle we are producing from Volkswagen. And I always get the question, why do you do this? Why do you still uh, supporting DSRC? And basically that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was also when speaking with Dino before, why tell why are still doing this? And basically I wrote down a couple of things. Um, so for everybody. And it's not a lot um, about technology. When you look at the technology as itself, the technology is the perfect technology for what it was supposed to do. I think Russell also told it that 20 years ago, we wanted to do something to have vehicles communicate and it's still valid today for what it was uh, designed to be, for having peer-to-peer -peer communication between vehicles, it's still the best available solution because it was designed to do it like this. And it's not just being designed to do exactly this, but it was tested and researched in the past, I wouldn't say 20 years, but let's say in the past seven to eight years, it was tested and standardized so that everybody can use the same technology in all of the vehicles. And Basically, that's why when I'm looking as a car manufacturer and wanted to do something, I need a tool for solving a problem. I'm seeing that's the right tool at this moment in time. It also when scales pretty well when looking at the spectrum needs, because basically it's also very simple in nature. If you can communicate with another vehicle, then you should communicate with it and you do, don't really need to have uh, some other third party or some other network operator telling you how to do it. That's why in this regard, it's also pretty simple to deploy and to use. And it also scales very well uh, without additional spectrum needs. Because basically you use the spectrum only around yourself. You don't really care what spectrum and how the communication works in two, three kilometers away because your vehicle, that it's not there physically yet. You only need to use the spectrum and the communication around you. And because it's simple, you don't really have a lot of problems with uh, getting the timing synchronized and um, getting uh, having problems with the high speeds of the different vehicle. For us, it's just basically saying it just works for exactly what you need it for V2X. The second point, what uh, why it's important for us and why we are deploying this, it's the deployment itself. I was also telling Dino before um, what the wireless technology basically is. It's just a small part, how it's working, what's the modulation, what's the spectrum, and so on. The biggest challenge we have, or let's say what 80% of um, my daily work is getting this technology integrated inside a vehicle. You have to have antennas. You have to have several antennas maybe inside a vehicle, which need to work together. Because unlike uh, cellular communication, where you have a communication between a vehicle and a base station, the most of the communication with other vehicles happens in one and a half meters above the surface. And there, the chassis of the vehicles plays a very important role. That's why it's a very interesting question, what kind of antenna patterns or how many antennas do you use in order to enable a vehicle to communicate itself? So getting one or another technology inside a vehicle, it's still a, a challenge for doing this. And it really helps up for not having an um, for having a, let's say, simple way of communicating. You see the other vehicle, you communicate with it. You don't care who's providing what's uh, the OEM behind this vehicle. You don't care about having a contract. You don't care about having some operator or some 
coordinator telling you how to use the spectrum and uh, how not to use the spectrum. And since it's that old, <laughs> the technology, uh, when the basis was set, it's um, very attractive for us from the risk management perspective because we really have a pretty good overview on the costs of the technology, on the IPR of the technology, and um, basically the operator costs behind them which are not existing at this point in time. And basically these are the two main drivers for, um, for putting the technology inside our vehicle. The technology, it's perfect for what was designed to do and it's still, there is no problem with the technology. And secondly, it very well deployable inside the vehicle. It really is well matched for what we want to put it inside the vehicle, which is a little bit different from putting it inside a smartphone. But since we are the future network, I also wanted to think about how do you see the future? Because uh, we see, of course, there is a lot of, I've been also last week at the Mobile World Congress and everybody is speaking about 5G and how the future will look like. And at least from my point of view, um, we see also in the future that we'll have different communication technologies in, inside the vehicle, um, each of them doing uh, what they better can do connect the different uh, wearables of the driver, for example, using uh, Bluetooth or having the users uh, located them around the vehicle using Bluetooth. You also have Wi-Fi, which enables you to offload a lot of the traffic uh, you need to put inside the vehicles. The vehicles will need a lot of data into the future. You also have a lot of cellular communication for providing information from the network to the vehicle. I don't think we'll... Uh, uh, I think I'm fully agreeing with Johannes that 100% of the vehicles coming will have a cellular communication. But we also think that they will have a V2V communication and V2X communication based on the SRC. And basically, that's also what we are working on. It's not just uh, what we have now. We already heard that both technologies are doing more or less the same. We are also working as a Volkswagen on bringing the future use cases. I myself, it's not just I'm working for Volkswagen, but I'm also the chair of the working group one inside the HCTC ITS, where we basically are standardizing the day two and day three application, which move in the direction of automated driving, um, where when we'll have vehicles starting to calculate trajectories, not with the driver, but having an automated calculating this, that they are able to share this trajectory with other automated driving vehicles in order to synchronize and basically go into the direction of having fully autonomous vehicle. And also colleagues of mine from the research department are looking how this scenarios and situation can be realized using the SRC. And up until now, I don't see any um, problem Coming from them, basically the evolution path we have from the SRC also based on the Wi-Fi evolution path with the uh, AC, AX, and now the BD working group starting um, by the IEEE, it's covering some of these issues. So basically, yes, unfortunately, I also see a more or less uh, split market inside the automotive industry. We have different uh, players supporting different uh, technologies. From my point of view, I see most of the volume manufacturers like um, GM, like a Toyota, like a Volkswagen supporting the SRC because it's easier to get it into huge mass of vehicles. And basically, when thinking about what V2X is, it's all coming down to penetration. And it's basically about not getting a lot of vehicles, uh, really a lot of vehicles with V2X on the streets. And that's why I'm a little bit positive seeing that the volume, the guys, putting the most of the vehicles on the roads are supporting the SRC because I think that's um, how we will get to a penetration up there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dino, you can provide your... Yeah, story. makes sense also because I was the one uh, asking Theodore why. <clears throat> no, I mean, with Theodore, of course, we have been meeting the last two years and debating a little bit. I come obviously from the other angle. Uh, first, let me um, introduce myself. I'm Dino Flora, Vice President of Qualcomm Technologies um, and responsible in Europe for Qualcomm products and technologies. Uh, so broad set of technology, but specifically I've been uh, following a little bit uh, um, all the evolution connected cars um, through my history, let's say. I've been uh, 
it was mentioned before, but then I like to remember that I was chairing 3GPP Run, uh, the radio group of 3GPP, when we introduced D2D communication, which is the foundation of uh, CV2X. And uh, prior to Johannes, I was uh, the one um, that put together the 5G Association. I've been uh, serving for a couple of years as a director general to hand over uh, to Johannes that is doing now fantastic job. So. What I wanted to say first, before going into the details and the theme of today, uh, is uh, that first of all, it's an exciting time uh, for Qualcomm and for the telecommunication world because uh, A, we are introducing the new generation technology, the 5G, and we are very excited about that. This is once every decade we do that. <clears throat> and we are very excited in general about uh, uh, what what is happening and uh, users will start to get um, uh, consumers will start to uh, have uh, uh, this technology and they can, will bring it to fruition already this year. Uh, and of course, it's also very important the work we're doing from the telecommunication world together with the automotive uh, partners uh, on how we can help them uh, actually work together to transform um, the transportation system and make it more intelligent in the future. So I see in terms of big picture, there is a, a great alignment with the, between telecommunication world and all automakers to work together uh, to, again, uh, design and develop this uh, smart mobility system of, of the future that can greatly improve the, um, let's say, uh, reduce, uh, improve safety as well as improve efficiency in the transportation system. So at high level, there is a great alignment. There is also very exciting for me that we are also introducing with 5G in general, but also we are introducing, and now I get to the theme of today's uh, discussion, we are also introducing a very, very important technology that is uh, the V2X technology, I will start general, uh, because it's again, it's a new framework which allows the car to communicate between each other and with the environment around them, with pedestrians, with the road infrastructure, with the network, so it's an important framework. Uh, and it's not like uh, without that things don't work because the way I look at it, this is it's an extra sensor which we will add to the car. So car will have anyway a bunch of sensors, radar, lidar, whatever. So, but we are adding a very powerful sensor, which is the the V2X framework, which will allow to cover some uh, more uh, use cases for safety and efficiency reasons. This sensor will allow car to signal to uh, each other intentions. So you can see how more powerful can be than passive sensors that are available today. And again, it will allow for low latency communication and therefore cover some uh, safety use cases, which with other sensors they could not be covered. But again, it's another sensor. It let to work, like to extend what Johannes was saying, autonomous driving or some level of autonomy, we'll have to work even without this technology. So we'll have to work also with other sensors. And then when you have this sensor, we'll be able to even do much more than that. Now, of course, the V2X in general, again, it's a great idea, but of course we are at the stage in which there is a big debate in the industry and then in a split in the automotive industry between these two technology. And it's a bit unfortunate, but it's also a healthy discussion on because uh, also previous speakers uh, in the previous panel were saying we need to make sure that we deploy a technology we really think it's uh, uh, forward looking it's secure it's safer and uh, so it's a very healthy debate that there is a big comparison of course maybe it would have been uh, easier without this debate uh, but I think it's also an healthy debate in some ways uh, maybe it will slow us down a little bit at the beginning because uh, like uh, uh, Theodore was saying adoption is key and the fact that there is a split in the industry is not helping um, uh, in terms of, of adoption of the CV, uh, of V2X technology in general. But I think we will overcome that one way or the other. Uh, it's an healthy debate. I personally, as I said, I come from the other camp. I'm uh, I, I'm a strong supporter of the cellular V2X technology, which, by the way, <laughs> just to uh, uh, just one comment on uh, to, the other works. He, he works. He can also work without uh, an operator involved uh, through a, a pure peer-to-peer -peer communication, the so-called PC5 mode. So it doesn't have to necessarily be routed through the network, just to be uh, clear. I wanted to make that precise. And again, the SRC technology is a great technology. From my perspective, it was standardized a long time ago when there was not a need, I think, because the need emerged 
recently. So it's a 20, the, what in a way my colleagues think is an asset, having been standardized 20 years ago, I see it as a legacy, so or a, or a burden. It, in the, it, just to clarify, CV2X is more powerful from my point of view as more performance, not because more intelligent people developed it. It's just that it was developed with state-of-the-art technology when the need arose. So state-of-the-art technology in 3GPP, 5GA, people, they got together, they developed it. It's the same people, same level of intelligence. It's just 20 years later, we got uh, the latest and greatest. And because of that, I believe there's a better performance and more integration with the um, overall cellular system and so on and so forth, which will make them win. But it would be an interesting debate. I will keep asking Theodore every time I meet him why. So uh, I plan to do so in the next three years. Actually, today I was told that the cycles in Volkswagen go three and a half years. So now for the next three and a half years, I will keep asking him every time I meet. So why? So. OK. Um, next up is Owen. Good morning. My name is uh, Onaran. I'm a CTO of Autotox. Uh, I founded Autotox more than 10 years ago, I think 11 years ago, to develop a V2X chipset. Uh, we started with DSLC and recently we moved uh, also to CV2X. If you would ask me in my worst nightmare 10 years ago, if I would have to wait more than 10 years till the mass market of V2X uh, uh, will start, I would really be horrified because this is not how it's supposed to be. I mean, at the early days of the market, the technology wasn't ready and it took time to ma uh, mature it. And later on, uh, there was always the, business, uh, the case of a business case, because why would someone pay for technology if it only exists in only a few of the cars? But I think now what holds it in, in some geographies, not in all, and we can discuss about this, it's the uh, debate and between technologies. And the last thing I can tell, talk about this debate and describe it as healthy, because there's nothing healthy about this. We're talking about human lives. And the need existed, because if we look at uh, the number of fatalities in European world, it's stagnated. It doesn't decrease. And despite all of the advanced uh, safety mechanisms that are included in the car, and we strongly believe, and I'm happy to see that everybody here in, in this panel believes and we share the same goal, that direct communication between vehicles has the potential to, uh, to save human lives. And, and that's the goal of all of us. And the earlier that we'll do it, the better. Now, the, the, there are a few things that are required, and this is according to the European Commission Directive, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, Eddie will talk about this soon. The first thing is interoperability. We must make sure that all vehicles are speaking the same language. We must make sure that if a Volkswagen car is entering the intersection, then a, a BMW car, for example, will be able to hear it. It cannot happen that uh, two manufacturers will crash because they don't understand each other. And the public will not accept that. I mean, the public doesn't care about which standard is used. No, it doesn't interest anyone, I think, besides people on this panel. The, pu the public want to see a working solution. And the second thing is backward compatibility, because now, uh, Volkswagen is making a huge investment. They're, they're working very hard to introduce this RC. And uh, the customers are entitled that the solution will work for the future. So it means that any solution that will be introduced later on will have to work with the uh, devices that will be launched in the Volkswagen solution. Now, what, what we've seen geographies that have clear guidance is that the V2X is moving forward. We see in China, China said uh, CV2X for whatever reason. And at most cases, the, the debate is not really this, uh, technical because technically, when we, we develop both, there's not really a difference. The debate is, is political, is business interest, and it's fine. But for example, in China, the government said, let's move forward and the market move forward. Everybody's running like crazy towards CV2X and, and China will be probably leading the market unless uh, VW is uh, uh, moving forward as they do. In Europe, uh, I think finally we see very strong move from the Commission. I think they did a very great job with the Delegated Act. I think it's very, it's great. It's, if it's balanced, uh, it supports uh, future proofing. And now that in two months, more or less, it will be uh, approved uh, officially. And then also in Europe, we will have the regulatory certainty which is required for uh, V2X. Uh, what we see in US, for example, it's an example of something that shouldn't happen. Because now in US, there's something happen, and then and there was a, a planned mandate in the previous administration, and then there was a new administration, now everything's stuck. And it will continue to stuck until there's a clear guidance. Because nobody, I think, would dare to launch a technology which doesn't know if it will be used or not used. And I don't see a scenario that there are going to be two technologies in a single vehicle. 
the, the cost burden is uh, high as it is. I mean, as I said, th there was always the business case question, uh, who will pay for it? I mean, why should I pay uh, for Vitorix in, in my car if only 1% of the other cars have it at the beginning, at the early days? So it's always a good question. So without the guidance, this will not happen. So I'm really I say, happy now about the progress in US and uh, hoping that it will be concluded. Okay. Good morning. My name is Marjorie Dickman, and I am pleased to join the ITU UNECE in this esteemed panel this morning. As head of global policy for Intel's Internet of Things and automated driving groups, I have a keen interest in the EU's vision for connected and automated mobility and digital policies. As the first speaker mentioned, we can all agree 1.3 million deaths from vehicles every year, 25,000 of which are in Europe, is unacceptable. So Intel stands with the EC on the objectives of the CITS Delegated Act, but we respectfully differ on the policy and the technology to achieve these objectives. Which raises the question for all of us on this panel and you here today, while ITS G5 may have been the right path when the ITS directive was adopted in 2010, is it the right path a decade later as we sit here today? Industry feedback, as my colleagues at Qualcomm and 5GAA have mentioned, indicates a changing tide towards support for cellular Vita X technology, or specifically LTE Vita X. Indeed, as they've mentioned, LTE Vita X offers superior performance and a clear evolution path to 5G, which as the EC has recognized in the context of the digital single market, will be one of the most critical building blocks for our digital society in the next decade. This changing tide towards cellular Vita X has happened at the same time in the United States. In 2014, the US government proposed to mandate a single purpose technology called DSRC for vehicle to vehicle safety communications. And at the time the mandate was proposed, there was strong momentum in favor of that single purpose technology mandate for vehicle to vehicle safety. However, just three years later in 2017, stakeholders, including 5GAA, underscored the rapid pace of technological progress with LTE Vita X and its evolution path to 5G. While noting the importance of DSRC investment by government and industry over the prior decade, companies urged the US government to change course and take a technology neutral and market-based approach towards V2V safety. Notably, the US government has not proceeded with its DSRC proposed mandates. Intel has taken a similar position on the, on the draft delegated act urging the EC to consider technology as it stands today. And rather than mandate ITS G5, take a technology neutral and market-based approach. In short, allow both ITS G5 and cel cellular Vita X, specifically LTE Vita X, to deploy day one CITS priority services. Yet the Delegated Act creates a de facto mandate in favor of ITSG5 and therefore is not technology neutral. Globally, other regions are taking a forward-looking approach. As the gentleman mentioned, China has adopted LTE Vita X as the future-proof technology on the path to 5G. In fact, China expects to cover almost all of its big cities and major highways with CV to X by next year. And in Asia Pacific, we're seeing widespread trials of CV to X in Japan 
and South Korea, as well as the trials we're seeing right here in Europe, in Germany, France, Spain, the UK, and other nations. So what is the key takeaway? It is that a decade makes a tremendous difference in technology innovation. And with global CV to X commercial launch expected this year, Intel respectfully submits that embracing a technology neutral and market-based approach will maximize safe, sustainable, and connected mobility across Europe and keep Europe a leading player in the ITS sector. Thank you, and I look forward to an exciting dialogue. Okay, Eddie. <laughs> yes, well, th thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. I think I'm the only government representative on the panel uh, this time. Um, sorry? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I, I think I had a background slide that I, I proposed. Yeah. Just, it's a picture, uh, to talk a little bit differently about it. I've been in a number of these panels before, and it's always about, you meet the mobility people, and it's about the digitalization of cars. And the slide that I wanted to present is actually about the mobilization of digital, meaning we have a digital society, and in what is coming up digitally, in platforms, in 5G, in um, uh, or, uh, IoT, all of that actually has a mobility component, it has an energy component, it has a building component. We haven't been talking today yet about how the car will actually speak to the building that it will be parked in. And that is part of what I would like to present coming from DG Connect. So my name is Eddie Hartog. I'm the head of unit for smart mobility and living in DG Connect. It's one of the, the services in the European Commission that deals with this issue uh, together with the colleagues from the mobility side and from the vehicle side uh, from the market. So that is really what I would like to present uh, uh, first. And if you then look at how this has historically evolved, we started with automation and actually my predecessors in uh, uh, DG Connect was then called very differently 13 and IMSS, so some people will know this, um, started all of this because it was all called ICT for transport and ICT for energy. This was before the internet even existed. And uh, at a certain point, we got into conversations as well about with the telecom sector, well, what are we gonna do about road safety? And a lot of them said like, well, yeah, road safety, that's not really my concern, you know, we do vehicles. Uh, uh, so actually that is why we started this whole uh, Wi-Fi thing. And Ross said it because everyone came to the conclusion that's where we will start. Marjorie is right in saying that it has evolved, and not only has it evolved that connectivity plays a much bigger role in this uh, debate than it did um, uh, 10 years ago, but also we've introduced the word of cooperation and cooperation comes before the interoperability because interoperability is one way of, of cooperating. And that's what we introduced also in, in the commission. So like, well, precisely what on set it's, you know, there's no point having all these things on the road and they do wonderful things, but they just can't work together, you know, so that's not gonna work. So that is why we have um, introduced that as well. Now, the question then is, what's, what is the choice? If you look at the, the text of the program, it looks like we're going to do a technology choice. Um, and let me tweak that a little bit, because for us as, as, as governments, and I think it's overall as government, it's not about a beauty contest. So this one is better than the other, and we're going to choose. I mean, that's what I often hear in these panels, which is fine. I look at it, thank you very much. And, but that's not the choice that we really have. The choice that we really have to make is about how can we deploy it now? Because as I'm talking, the five minutes that I have, uh, if I like to listen to Jean Todt, 10 people get killed on the road. Yeah, So uh, that is something that we need to address urgently. And you need to address that um, with the technology that exists as quickly as possible. And that is where the road authorities and, and, and the national governments will have to make a choice. What am I going to invest in? Yeah, It's the investment decision. At the same time, the choice is then, yeah, we need to invest now, but we also need to make sure that our investment now will still benefit us in 30 years' time. And that is really the challenge. It's not about beauty concepts, it's about how can you mix that. Now, in the European Union, we um, we, we will do that through this uh, delegated act. I think some of you have seen the first draft. Uh, some of you have uh, written very interesting comments on this, and we're now digesting all of this, and very soon we will come up with precisely that sort of balance between investing now and making sure that it's future-proof. Now, I think part of the solution in that cooperation is going to be precisely what was said on interoperability. 
a lot of discussions on interoperability are going on. And for me, the solution needs to be found by the people here, not by us, not by the government. It's a private sector problem, private sector generated problem that needs a private sector uh, solution. And that is why we have emphasized very much the work in, in Etsy and, and FreeGPP and all the, 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 the bodies that work with these standards to actually solve this and then to add and to solve this quickly because you know these debates are going on and on about and that is really the message that i've given when i went to the etsy board um, uh, last summer i said you know this is an issue it's, it's becoming a political issue and it's actually you're generating this political issue so it's about time that you solve it and what you see then by governments making choices whether that's in china one choice in the us another choice. by the way in the us i, I spoke to well i won't say to who but sort of uh, counterparts that i have in the us and i said well, how do you deal with this interoperability they said well first of all we actually think if we were to invest now we should say D dsrc because that exists but on the other hand we would also tell our public procurement people don't be stupid don't buy things or roadside units that are locked into technology for the next 30 years so make sure that you can actually pluck something out and pluck something else in that works you see that is really the the solution so that is their way of looking at the interoperability we've said you need to do that through the standard standard setting bodies and there we would want everyone to cooperate. I mean, you mentioned backward compatibility, people say forward compatibility. The bottom line is we're not going to lock ourselves into one technology and all players, all players need to be bold. So it's not like, oh yeah, we've now chosen this and we can sit back and the others, the newcomers need to solve our problem. We really insist that all players will do this. Now, a last comment is going back to this uh, telecommunications automotive. Um, within the commission, I mean, it's not me, it's my, my political bosses. They had all these conversations. Erting was one of them, and they spoke to the uh, automotive sector, and, they, and then an hour later, they received the telecom sector. And at a certain moment, he asked, have you ever spoken together? But not really, you know. Uh, you know so we, we're doing our own thing, and that is, was precisely part of the problem. I must say I'm impressed in what has happened in industry, and I pride myself particularly in European industry, in the synergies that have been created over the last three years, 5G uh, AA is one of them, but we also have the European Automotive Telecom Association that actually said, let's do a couple of things together. And if, I think it's really there that the solution needs to be found. We all know that there's a problem. We all know that the old days of let's hope that one standard wins over the other, you know, the old uh, television standards and the, and the video standards. I mean, those days are gone in standard setting. Uh, uh, you really need to make sure it's interoperable. And really the pressure now is on, on Etsy and actually meeting this week again, uh, I understand, so to, to solve this, this problem. But it requires the contribution from all partners on their panels and the colleagues that go to these bodies. So that is really my appeal for, for this morning. Okay, thanks. Eddie, I just want to say I appreciate you coming and that the European Commission and this going back to many of your um, almost ancestors, um, Fotos Karamitsos, and getting the ITS World Congress going in Paris, orig originally Andre Witz, Johanny Jaskalen, has been mm -hmm. tremendous contribution to this, so we appreciate mm -hmm. it. So let mm -hmm. me go on and let Andre have his say. Hi, okay. thanks, Russ. So I'm Andre Cardot. Mm -hmm. I'm the head of products at Venium. Working? And and uh, Venium is a tech startup uh, which is helping auto EMs move large amounts of data from the vehicle to the cloud uh, and back. And why is this important? It's important because as vehicles become more and more connected, uh, there's more data that can be uh, moved between the vehicle and the cloud, and which can enable new uh, use cases and revenue streams for for auto EMs. So, for instance, uh, by having more data from all the vehicle sensors in the cloud, auto EMs are able to reduce their warranty costs. Um, and uh, avoid expensive recalls, for instance. Uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, as the vehicle becomes more and more uh, a bunch of software lines rather than um, uh, a physical product, uh, a hardware thing, um, we need to deploy auto EMs, we need to deploy uh, uh, software updates for over the air software updates more often. Uh, and this is a lot of data that they need to, to, to move between the vehicle um, and the cloud. But we also know that not all this 
data is real-time critical. So a software update, if it's not safety critical, might wait for a week. Or uh, data that comes from vehicle sensors might wait for 48 hours. It doesn't need to go immediately to the cloud. It doesn't even need to be transferred through the expensive cellular network, which is available at most of the times, or if not uh, all the time. So Venim is helping OEMs prioritize this data and enabling them to use different technologies at different points in time, depending on where the vehicle is, what it's, what's its state, whether it's moving or stopped, uh, and accessing technologies like Wi-Fi, like cellular, like uh, uh, V2X technologies, I'm not going to say DSRC or CV2X, one of both, um, and any other technology that comes in the future. But it's really about deciding when to send which data uh, to the cloud or to the vehicle. Um, we do this by uh, through a, a software platform, which has two components. One component that sits in the cloud and that's responsible for orchestrating the whole uh, network, and one component that sits in the in the vehicle software, so in the connectivity control unit or uh, telecommunications control unit. The way it works is the OEM sets the, the policies for data upload or download from the vehicle in the cloud. These are translated into local rules in the vehicle, and then the vehicle operates uh, independently. I'm not going to say autonomously because that's when we're talking about vehicles, that might be a different thing. Um, so right now you're probably thinking, so why are you in this, uh, in this panel and why is this relevant for this panel? And that has to do with yet another uh, value proposition of Venium, which is that once vehicles get data uh, from the cloud, for instance, a software update, they can share it with each other as long as it's common information. They can, can also upload information through other vehicles to the cloud. And this uh, is what we call peer-to-peer -peer, uh, content distribution. So using peer-to-peer -peer communica communications, and for that, we need vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, be them DSRC, CV2X, or any uh, upcoming technology. So really looking forward to the panel. Um, there's one challenge I would like to leave to the panel and to the, um, and to the audience, which is it's time for us to think about vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle technologies beyond safety. So safety is super important. Yes, that's true. But there's applications beyond safety that we can enable nowadays. Thanks. Okay, Michael, I left you for the last since Ericsson has been a leader in pushing cellular technology into automotive in Europe. So you could take the last word. Yeah, glad to be here on the panel. Um, my name is Michael Meyer. I'm uh, working at Ericsson Research. Um, uh, de facto, this also means that uh, we typically take a little bit of a longer term perspective and uh, look also a little bit into the future. Um, I'm working with two aspects that are related here. On the one hand side, um, in my organization, we are responsible for the standardization in 3GPP of technology, so 5G technology, LTE technology, and as part of that also V2X. And the second part is that I'm uh, heavily involved in publicly funded projects, particularly in the automotive domain, where we work together with uh, the OEMs, the tier ones like Volkswagen, like BMW, like PSA, Volvo, uh, Bosch and so on, in order to uh, come to a view how the future for V2X communication and uh, connected mobility can look like. Yeah, uh, actually quite difficult. I think most of the thoughts that I would have had in mind uh, prior to the discussion have been have been raised. But uh, maybe I can use that opportunity to. Uh, to reflect already a little bit upon what I've what I've heard here. So first of all, I think it's important to understand that 5G is here, like Dino has it on his uh, <laughs> on his T-shirt. Um, has been standardized, uh, or the, the first version of the standard has been finalized next year. We have now made also some progress when it comes to V2X enhancement. Just last week, the study item in 3GPP was finalized, where the main conclusion was that uh, both the NR cycling and the LTE cycling are able to support the automotive use cases. Uh, we foresee that only for the for the UU, for, so for the interface between the base station and the, and the vehicle only, if at all, only marginal extensions are needed to, all the, uh, to the already existing 5G standard in order to fulfill the requirements of the automotive communication. Um, for the NR side link, the work still needs to happen, so we will standardize an NR side link until the end of the year, and then also that kind of functionality will be available. 
So that is one part. Um, then I would also like to talk about um, uh, our collaboration projects that we run, for example, on, on EU level. There are projects like 5G Car, like uh, 5G Croco, which are really key for us um, in order to derive a mutual understanding between the OEMs, between the automotive industry and uh, the telco industry. I think these uh, activities are accompanying the activities that go on in, in 5G AA because we are working on the research side, uh, side, our insights are fed into bodies like 5G AA, but of course also, 5G, uh, also 3GPP in order to drive the technology in the right direction. And I must say what, what I've seen so far is uh, I, think, I think we have achieved this. I think we have technology at hand that is able to, fill, to fulfill all the requirements that we've seen so far. And this goes beyond the safety use cases. You've, you've mentioned that other use cases uh, will become more and more important. And in particular, uh, some of those require clearly a, a network interface. Um, for example, if we think about the downloading uh, uh, highly accurate accurate um, maps or if we think about remote driving i think remote driving is one one really critical use case in order to come to the vision of autonomous driving because ultimately cars will end up in situations where they are not able to maneuver themselves and then some remote interaction is required and then only a v2v component doesn't bring us much further yeah, um, then considering what I've heard so far here in the panel, I reacted on a few things. So I think uh, Theodore said that uh, he believes that 11P is a superior technology. I, I, don't, I don't believe in that. That's one part. Uh, the other part I'm concerned about is the Delegated Act. Um, uh, one speaker here said that he, uh, he is happy with the current formulations in the Delegated Act. Uh, we would actually prefer a more... Uh, balanced, more technology neutral um, version of the uh, delegated act. And, and then as, as also um, was mentioned before, we would like to see that the market finally decides. Uh, and now I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we've gone through what we did pretty good, 55 minutes instead of 40 minutes, so not bad. Um, so questions what would you like to hear out here somewhere there should be microphones um so who wants to start off from the audience uh, this is a question for theodore yeah, identify yourself oh, please. Uh, mike senna i'll be moderating the next session uh, question for Theodore. Yes. You listed all of the advantages of Wi-Fi, ITS, G5, 802.11p, WAVE. Are there any disadvantages? Yes. <clears throat> Could you enumerate them, please? <laughs> <laughs> of course, there are not so many, at least from my perspective. I think there are some other guys in the panel which can tell a little bit more of the disadvantages. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind why the technology, what was developed for and um, how it fits with the needs. And basically, yes, um, I think one of the um, disadvantages when uh, we're looking at it is, yes, it's um, still, um, let's say, based on old technology. That might be one of the, um, of the disadvantages um, which are going to be addressed with the new working groups inside of IEEE. So I think it's important to know what are the flaws or what's missing in order to correct it. And basically that's um, one of them. Um, just to make sure it's based on an old technology, but it's still matching all the requirements for what it was designed to. That's why we still think it's um, the right choice to do it. And I think um, one, um, let's say personal um, disadvantage, what my wish uh, would have been in the last years so when trying it to bring it into the vehicles is um, you really need to have um, to be used it, not just for safety, but also use it for um, other use cases, which are 
basically improving your business case. Because with safety, it's very hard to make a business case, especially when you are based on the penetration. And um, I think this issue currently, it's not addressed on the technology level because you still have 11P. But this, um, this missing point was addressed by the suppliers of the chipsets, but basically providing a dual um, usage chipsets, which can we also, for example, use for uh, doing standard Wi-Fi AC. And basically, when looking at um, the use cases uh, we heard from the colleagues from Denium, it's basically also what we do. We see a lot of data coming there, and this kind of data, you don't really need to put it on the cellular network because it's not something you need now. You really need to do some kind of offloading, what we call it. And this offloading, you can only do with another technology. And 11P, it's not the technology to do it. don't have the data rates, but the hardware behind it, what provides you the 11P can be used for this offloading. You can really download a lot of data when your vehicle is in your garage at home or at the um, um, loading, uh, charging at the charging station. And basically, you don't need to do any DSRC because you're not on the road. You don't need to say the others, here I am, here I am, as uh, Russ already said, but you can really do it in Wi Fi mode. So, this is one of the disadvantages. It's too much focused on the safety and for what's coming up um, afterwards, uh, automated driving, and it's not helping the business case. But the chipset recognized that, and um, let's say the problem is addressed in a parallel <laughs> path. These are the two disadvantages which I think delayed with some years an introduction of one or another. Okay, Theodore, let me put you on the spot in one thing. Well, I hear... I'm the guy on the spot anyway. <laughs> uh, no. No, you, I hear from... Some of the car companies concern about cybersecurity, and cybersecurity is the next mm -hmm. thing. And um, at least some car company people, and I'm sure my 5GAA colleagues here will uh, certainly jump in, but say that they don't see how we can really do good cybersecurity for 802.11p without having cellular to be able to currently at all times be able to get cert security certificates to the vehicle if you're actually going to get to direct communications. What What's your position on that? Um, I fully agree with you. We need an additional communication. Let's say you could say if you really don't want to use cellular because you don't like it. And trust me, I like it. I'm active in 5G. I'm a big supporter of 5G. That's why we discuss a lot about it. So the alternative is, I don't know, you get a USB stick and you put every week certificates. That's not something anybody would actually do in the vehicle. And um, basically, we are going to use also the cellular network from getting them. But it's still for us, when looking from the DSRC or 11P part, it's another, it's a separate channel. It's an offload channel we are planning on using. And let me tell you something, the biggest problem we currently have, and having this deployment and putting it on the road, it's not uh, the cybersecurity because I think the mechanisms are so safe and the pseudonym certificates and everything behind it, the infrastructure needed, it's so complex and <laughs> has been also by the commission discussed in the past year with the um, certificate policy and, 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 and I'm pretty sure that uh, it's going to work. The biggest uh, challenges we have now are based on the, um, uh, how it's called in English, it's the GDRP. It's basically, we have this very interesting question, if the driver really doesn't want to go online, because you still have a lot of drivers who say, I don't want my car to be connected, I want to keep it offline. I still want to have e-call, I still want to have safety, I still want to have DSRC and have active safety, but I don't want to go online. And that makes it for us, uh, we have a lot of legal questions to answer. How do you provide a service to a customer, like a service, giving him certificates for DSRC when he doesn't want to go online at all. And that's why we're discussing, I'm doing a lot of discussion with lawyers, for example, and it's not uh, so much with the technical guys. I think technically we can manage to do anything, but getting the right legal um, framework. And I think also in the delegated act, there are several requirements that you have to support the certificate revocation lists every week. And when looking, uh, what are the possibilities? Basically, you can tell every week the customer, you have to go online. You have to go online, otherwise your V2X is not functioning. What he will do, he'll deactivate it. And then we don't have any safety, regardless of which technology is there. We don't care if it's, he doesn't understand it's one technology or another. And 
that's the main challenge here. How do you address this kind of worries of the customer? Because they say, I don't want to be tracked. I want to have safety. I understand how V2V is working also with the PC5, with the mode 4, where the network operator, I am have a lot of customers saying, we don't want to be tracked. I want to have safety. I understand it's locally, but I don't want to have any communication with the network as a generic term. It's something we need. Okay. So Aaron, I hear you. I, I have the microphone. Ross, Ross, could I just come in on the same point of security? No, it's here, Ross. On the same point of security. Um, because I think in the Delegated Act, we try to address some of these things uh, in their balance. Now, first of all, I'm not a technician, so I'm, I'm a little bit on the dodgy ground here. But I understand when we speak V2V and peer-to-peer, that's not what this uh, G5 actually is, because it's broadcasting. It's saying, I'm here, and hope that someone picks it up. And that requires a different type of cybersecurity than you would have in the peer-to-peer. -peer. And I think that is what we've tried to address with the colleagues from JRC into a certificate sort of certificate system. I mean, so I, I just wanted to mention that, um, uh, that we try to do that. The same thing, um, we, we talk about mandating. As a European Union, we've actually decided not to mandate you know, we, we mentioned two other countries that have either uh, tr thought about mandating and or, or are mandating is specific. We've decided not to do that. <laughs> We've also decided not that it's not obligatory. So you, that's why the cooperation comes in. You make a choice to cooperate or not. But if you don't cooperate, then don't expect the benefits. If you see what I mean. So that, I think it's an important point uh, to make. I would be curious over time if, if but I'll, we let the, we let the other questions come in to also see how the various colleagues have reacted to the various um, initiatives in other countries. For example, in China, I'm just curious to see what Volkswagen is going to do in China, uh, because I assume they will uh, have to deploy also connected automated cars. Uh, yeah. So, but it's different technology. In the US, uh, again, it's different and in other countries. But I would be interested to, to not to focus only on the EU because, after all, we are in a global uh, context. Thank you. Darren can identify himself. He's from the UK government, head of the cyber secure, UN cybersecurity effort. Um, so, hopefully, it's on. Um, hi. As Good introductions and good uh, discussion so far. Um, I think on DSRC and telecoms, a lot of work's been done securing the messages. Um, we've recently done some work, and I think others have, that shows the onboard units actually themselves are not that secure. Um, they can be hacked. You can get root control. You can put in whatever data you like and generate messages whenever you like on the systems we've tested. Um, so the quality of the data is open to abuse. How would you see your implementations dealing with such abuse, which will happen in the real world when the general public get their hands on your technology? So not the security of the messages, which has been looked at, but security of units generating the messages. So if you look at the car to car consortium on the security, there are two aspects. The first one is the security of the HSM, which is the vault that stores the private keys. And this is, should have very high certification. Uh, no, 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 no. And, and the second security scope is the ECU. Or it's not the ECU itself, it's the V2X gateway. And, and that's another uh, uh, scope which uh, has EEL2, it's a lower level of security, but still, uh, it's now not included in the delegated act, but uh, I expect that OEMs will demand uh, either self-certification according to the common criteria guidelines or an, an official common criteria certification for the V2X gateway. And part of the boundaries of the V2X gateway is, is also the integrity of data. So each unit has to uh, assure the integrity of the interfaces. So you will not be able to hack those interfaces and plus to do some plausibility checks and plausibility checks is required uh, for the data that you transmit and also for the data that you receive. And on top of that, you apply misbehavior detection for the scenario that someone, I think, for example, uh, GNSS can be easily hacked, but then you need to do some misbehavior detection to detect that uh, uh, some hacking attempt, attempt took place. And, and this is why you have the CRL, for example, in US, then you report it to a centralized server, and then it decides according to majority if this is a risk or not. But it's really too complex for <laughs> this uh, family. Okay. Uh, 
Actually, not on this question because it was a very nice question, but I, I cannot answer. Actually, maybe a, a car manufacturer should answer because uh, we don't. Uh, Qualcomm, we don't. I mean, we are not really experts on uh, the security of the generator of messages, uh, like the gentleman said. We, we look at more security of messages, so it's not my domain of expertise. I, I wanted to comment on uh, the question before, but I will derail the discussion. So maybe if the other wants to answer the specific question. Maybe a quick question. Uh, that um, possible attack scenario, it's something we are, we've been um, looking at from several perspectives. It's not just, let's say, the V2X um, gateway, which might be uh, attacked this way. It's a lot of other communication units, as you already said. We, I think we've seen a lot of uh, presses about BMWs being hacked or Tesla or I don't know. And basically this problem of how do you make sure that the data you get in one or another issue, regardless of what scope you can also have for radar or something. This is something our security guys are working and they have very good uh, mechanisms to secure what the data in transit from one issue to another issue and basically to make sure that the data is authentic and both for the, let's say, Ethernet based communication and also for the CAN based communication. And um, it usually working on having the ECUs reciprocally authenticating themselves and basically only data from ECUs you already know and you already trust and which are signed with these certificates are going to be validated by the other ECU before you put it in any V2X message or telematic message or whatever. I think we will discuss this on the next panel, but you know, security is an issue where you can, of course, you have to spend a lot of efforts within the system and regardless of the technology, you know, that is, it has nothing to do whether we are talking about PC5 or DSRC as a transportation a channel. You have to spend a lot of effort into the, into the system as such, into the control unit, but a secure system only works, and that is, by the way, the reason why we are talking about cyber security, if, this, if the system is connected. Because, you know, you can design the best secure system, you can hack it, if it's not connected, you cannot repair it uh, very easily to say. So uh, the question is, how often do I get connection to that system? Is it once a week? Is it once a month? Or is it never because the customer decides that I, would, I don't want to be online? You know, and if you, are, if you don't have an online system, then, then it, it, it can be not secured in, in that way on an operational uh, basis. So so we need the network anyhow, whether it is a mobile network or whether it's a USB, uh, let's say, a plugged in network or something like that. Um, it, it is not convenient for the customer. So in, in, inside the 5GA, we spent a lot of effort during the past two years with a specific task force, which explores how to build up, how to set up a secure system, not only based on technology, but also based on legal processes, on operational processes. At the end, it has to be operational uh, with millions of cars, with millions of customers, with millions of roadside units to create at the end something which was written on, on, the, on the slide uh, uh, Eddie has shown. And that is trust. If we don't trust the other communication partner, we cannot use the information, as Dino has said, as an additional sensor. I can only use an additional sensor if I trust the additional sensor. Or on the other word, on the other hand, if there is mistrust uh, between the sensors, then I will not use the information. Yeah. Okay. Roger. Thank you, Russ. Uh, Roger Lanto, uh, Director, Automotive Connected Mobility in the Global Automotive Practice at Strategy Analytics. Um, I I think uh, most people that are intensely involved in this debate and discussion are aware of a second generation DSRC uh, proposition, uh, but I don't always see it consistently being discussed or what the implications of such a potentially interoperable or not interoperable second generation uh, is uh, on this conversation, uh, because the, the issue is, you know, uh, future-proofing uh, whatever technology we choose. So I'm curious if anybody on the panel is, is uh, uh, prepared or equipped to, to address this topic. 
maybe I can give a couple of um, of answers. Yes, we are very much aware, and we are working together with Toyota, for example, in the U.S. Um, for inside the, I think it's called the BD Group now, uh, the IEEE. And basically, what we also done, it's um, through our activities inside the 3GPP. Um, I think it was um, last year uh, when it was the the ask. We were asked as automotive to provide requirements for the 5G new radio because that's something we also want to use at some point in time at, I don't know, 2024, 2025, um, use and include it inside our vehicles, the 5G new radio. And one of our inputs to the 3GPP was let's not have the whole discussion we have now with uh, LTV and DSRC that basically they ignore each other due to different reasons. They don't everybody expects that i only have the spectrum for this one technology and we gave the requirement please consider also non-3 gpp technologies inside the frequency band so basically if there are some guys like us or like toyota or some somebody else who wants to include wi-fi based technologies in some future spectrum for its that the three gpp technologies are aware they are able to detect this technology and make countermeasure. Also, the other way around, we provided to the IEEE the requirement, please consider that in the same spectrum, you might have non-IEEE technologies, like 3GPP ones. And um, the IEEE group took this requirement. In the 3GPP, we were kind of a set, thanks for the input, but we don't consider non-3GPP technologies. It was, for me, it was a deja vu for the input I gave a couple of years ago when the release 14 was discussed uh, for uh, cellular V2X or for LTV, when also, um, I think it's a, the way that 3GPP mostly works. Um, all the mechanisms for non-3GPP technologies are kind of a, not in scope of 3GPP. And that's where we are coming today on this, uh, discussing about spectrum splits or using totally different spectrum for technologies doing exactly the same. Sorry. So just to answer uh, Roger, we're taking active part in the uh, IEEE 11 BD. I mean, I'm going to be next week in uh, Vancouver in the plenary meeting. Uh, the idea is that it shares this, the same channel. So you can actually activate 8 to 11 BD next to 11 P. And when 11 B unit detects the presence of 11 P unit, it acts as 11 P unit. So that can have a gradual introduction of technology with full coexistence and full interoperability. So we'll not have this discussion. It's actually a, a clear generation that you have the ability to go directly from one generation to another. Uh, but the assumption uh, that we have in the market, and as, as Theo said, all the use cases can be supported with 11P. 11BD uh, just gives you more bandwidth and uh, higher performance, but you can do still do the same with 11P. I accumulated a few comments, but maybe. Uh, so I start from the, the final one. Um, yes. The cellular v 2 give you better performance. I will say, I will claim twice the range. So, and I understand we, we went in this discussion with Theodore in the past. Uh, Theo said, well, most of the things I, I need to do is in the short proximity. So I don't, I don't mind. But again, from our point of view, double in the range opens up more safety use cases and more uh, situations. So it's important that uh, is also part of the future proving and having the latest technology. So it cannot be this scandal like that to say, okay, we cover the basics. We are done. We rush with the this old technology. So from our perspective, we should not overlook these kind of things. Like in passing, say, okay, yeah, that's my. We just cover the basics, so we go ahead. Now, the second comment I wanted to make, based on the discussion we were having before, which is important from an ecosystem point of view, which we should not forget. I'm glad that uh, Theodore conceded that. Uh, for security, for many other things. Anyway, the cellular connectivity will be in the car. So establish that. Now, I'll claim that the civil tracks technology has much better integration with the, the cellular connectivity. Meaning, and I'm not discussing prototypes, things that are seen in the market, but uh, I can tell you as a Qualcomm, there is a clear path to have a single chipset doing both connectivity to cellular, with the cellular network connectivity car to car, single solution. So if you have to have the cellular connectivity anyway, 
which is becoming pervasive in the cars anyway. My point is, from an ecosystem point of view, it's obvious an advantage to have a single solution, like an integrated approach, future-looking, forward-looking, evolving to 5G, because also from an ecosystem point of view, it's a single integrated solution. And again, that's the path we are trying to go with Qualcomm. Because, of course, the other path is yet another technology in parallel to do some other things. So that's uh, I wanted to point out uh, this. Sorry, I would I would like to add one point, which is which is very important um, when it comes to ecosystem. Of course, we are sitting together at the future networked car symposium. But if it comes to the fatalities on the road, more than 30, 40, 50 percent of the fatalities are not sitting in a car. So these are the pedestrians. These are the cyclists. These are the ones who are sitting on a motorcycle. These are the so-called vulnerable road users from the car manufacturer's perspective. And the question is, how can we include these citizens, these participants on the, on the road, also into a safety-related system? And that is, from an ecosystem perspective, a very important topic. And when it comes to the question, what Dino has mentioned, that the cellular connectivity is already there. Every customer, every participant on the road, more or less, has some sort of cellular connectivity in his pocket, on his bike, yeah, under his shoes or whatever. Then these kind of, these kind of components, we have, to, we have to elaborate, and we are doing that intensively in the 5GA, how to include these participants, these vulnerable road users, also into a safety-related system. And again, the CV2X with a clear evolution path to 5G plays a very important role when it comes to the question, how can we include these, these uh, traffic participants into the, into the general system? And this kind of answer, or this kind of question we have also to raise when it comes to safety, when it comes to traffic efficiency, but especially when it comes to safety. So, just make a quick point. So, I, referring to your point and just a couple other things I've heard here, I think one of the things we need to think about as we think about the future, it's, it's about the practicality of not just building a network, but maintaining a network. And one of the, if you have a single purpose network, for example, for ITS G5, as the EC's CITS impact assessment stated, there's going to be a large investment um, as well as operational costs, not only to build that network, but then you have to maintain that network. And who bears that operation, that cost, both initially and going forward? You can have the best network initially, but if the industry is not going to continue to support that and there are not other revenue models to support a network, it's very hard to project that that network will be maintained in any way that will be usable in the future of the network car. And I'd say just also point out that this is one of the reasons that the U.S. hasn't gone forward with its DSRC mandate. The Department of Transportation acknowledged that it will cost 108 billion USD to deploy a DSRC network across the entire uh, country of America, and it would take until 2060 to have 100% penetration. So if, if you think about that, if we're waiting till 2060 for this technology to be able to have any effective penetration and be therefore be effective in preventing accidents, we're, we're not at 5G, we're not at 6G, we might even be at 7G. So it's just, I think that's something, the practicality of all of this, as we think about future-proofing technology, is something incredibly important to think about. And just another last point to that. Just consider that 5G networks are expected to cover 
three quarters of Europe by 2025. And why is that? It's because the private sector is investing a huge amount of money in these 5G networks. And the private sector will continue to maintain those networks for the future as they evolve to 6G, 7G, whatever, 8H, whatever it may be. And I think these practical points or something really important, both from a private sector investment, but if I'm sitting in the policy maker uh, seat as well, to know that going forward, that my country, my region will be able to lead in the ITS sector, be able to save the most lives, protect its citizens, and also increase efficiency and mobility using these technologies. Yeah, Marjorie, let me add one more U.S. piece since we have a limited Americans here. Um, <laughs> as, as you know, and you participated, in the U.S. DOT recently put out a request for comments on this. Um, one of the other things which you didn't mention is that in the U.S., um, we have a thing called FirstNet, um, a congressionally determined operation for police, fire, and ambulance that has, by FCC mandate, using cellular. So all police, fire, and ambulance in the U.S. will have to use cellular, and all traffic signals in the U.S. for signal phase and timing will have to use the cellular V2X technology to transmit what their signal is for the police cars. So part of the reason that the U.S. DOT is going back and looking at this is do they really want to have passenger cars with a different technology than the public safety cars? So that's not a European problem because you haven't done anything similar here in Europe, but it is a strong U.S. problem. So... Now, sorry to interrupt, but that I wanted to cover. Uh, so, uh, just to reflect uh, for a few comments that uh, were said here. First, about uh, uh, vulnerable road users. Uh, as, as I see it, I don't see any difference or any uh, relation on the technology. As a matter of fact, uh, a smartphone, which is DCRC based, was already demonstrated five years ago by Qualcomm. And probably they know that uh, because every smartphone has a Wi-Fi, and so the, the technology exists in today's smartphone. You don't need to develop anything new. So it, I don't see this as a, any reason to determine one technology or another. Uh, now another thing regarding infrastructure. So what, what is this C infrastructure? So the DSC doesn't require any infrastructure to operate. The only infrastructure is safety services. So. A safety service, for example, is a smart intersection that you have an intersection and you have camera and the camera detects a pedestrian and detects other vehicles that don't have communication. And uh, th that kind of uh, infrastructure actually exists in Japan. So in Japan, there are uh, something like 30, 20 or 30 uh, intersections that includes cameras and the cameras transmits via DSRC uh, to the vehicle uh, about alerts. And the statistics is amazing. The statistics show that there's 40% uh, decrease in accident probability for uh, vehicles with V2V in those intersections. So that's the nature of infrastructure, and I think that we all would like to see those kind of smart intersections uh, all around the world. Yeah, so I'd like to ask one question to you guys. Um, the discussion about the, the future, I'm glad to see I'm not the only one to drop the microphone. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, when we started this 20 years ago, the main purpose was peer-to-peer, -peer, vehicle to vehicle communications, not a here I am message. When in both 802.11p and in cellular V2X, will the technology be ready to have true peer-to-peer -peer, um, sessions set up and handled? And related to that, in the standards efforts, how many um, experts, et cetera, are working in the standards effort in the 3GPP, um, I guess it's really 16, next generation, in the 802.11p, or going to, I think it's 802.11b, or what have you that you're talking about. So can you guys give me 
reasonable estimates of dates of when these will be ready and how many experts are working on each of these? Maybe for the 5G8, uh, um, maybe Dino, you can say something for the 3GPP and how many people are working on the, on the really 16 uh, standardization activities. Um, these, let's say, real peer-to-peer, -peer, not only here I am and broadcasting. So these real peer-to-peer -peer communication is a uh, very important um, so-called work item within the uh, 5GA. So around, I would say, 25 companies are working on that, uh, mainly based from the car manufacturers and from the, from the um, uh, tech companies like Qualcomm, Intel, Samsung. Um, are, are um, providing the technology as but but more importantly providing the use cases and the protocols and the standards which are needed for uh, uh, not un only understanding each other but for ne negotiating each other you know that's that's more importantly it, it's some sort of negotiation if you are talking about traffic it's about cooperation and cooperation is always some something which ends, let's say, at a, at a short, very simple contract. That means two meters to the left and uh, the other three meters to the right, and then we can avoid the collision. And uh, that is something um, I would say um, 20, 30 companies are working intensively inside the 5GA uh, around these kind of use cases, and we will see them in the market at the latest, I would say, in 2025, 2026. Maybe I'll comment on 3GBP, especially from uh, my past. So 3GBP is a huge, it's a humongous human endeavor. So we're talking about uh, people are not only working on uh, um, next generation B2X system, which will start to have the capability Russell was talking about. Uh, they're working on various things, but the group is huge. And uh, we're talking about, uh, I don't know. So if I had to give you a number, 2,000 plus people, working on next generation standards. No, no, not, no, yeah, not all, no, no, but the, no, no, you have to understand the 3GPP process. As I said, they are working on many things, but it's not like, okay, we are talking about the uh, next generation VSRC and suddenly 1,900 people exit the room and remains just a couple of people. So it's an humongous endeavor because there are round one, the group doing the physical layer, there are 500 people. And of course, when you're discussing the five aspects, the physical layer aspect of B2X, maybe 20 people will be more active, but still, there are five people, 500 people in the room from a variety of companies, and they will be entitled to talk. Sometimes they will talk. I've been chairing 3GPP meeting for a long time. It's a very tough thing. By the way, it's a tough thing, but it's a very successful endeavor from an ecosystem point of view, and that goes back to the question of the ecosystem. The automotive industry has also embraced the, the 3GPP technology in general because, again, it's making use of the mobile ecosystem, reuse it and leverage it on the car thing. But then we go back to uh, Johannes' argument. The ecosystem point of view, it's very important. Even when we are talking about pedestrian, and uh, I have to beg to, I beg to disagree with my colleagues from uh, Volkswagen and Autotalks, you cannot simply say, yeah, it's the same thing. You just put uh, this in the smartphone and uh, my company showcase it for four years ago there's nothing compared to it so it's obvious that uh, the, the chances that cv2x will be much more integrated in the same chipset that it does cellular phone as way higher you cannot make it sound like okay easy it's a very naive thing to think that uh, you 100 million cars you're going to impose a technology to cellular uh, smartphones which is one billion it's one order of magnitude bigger ecosystem guys so it's just uh, not the way the, the world works in the mobile ecosystem theodore you want to get one now give me my microphone. All right. <laughs> the, 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 exactly that was yours yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay theodore i know you can say the same thing about 802.11 the 802.11 meetings are thousands of people and I'm, what have you. So my question again goes, for the specific part you're working on, Dino came up with 20 experts, maybe that's in the right number. What's what's in your side? Because I know John Kenny and I know you, now who else is working on it? <laughs> uh, let me give you a couple of uh, 
you had to ask two questions before. Yeah. Uh, first about the number of people and about uh, if we are going to move uh, beyond this here I am uh, mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So the first answer is um, at least the guys I'm paying or on my payroll and uh, which I send them through to 5GAA and to 3GPP. <laughs> and I'm also working at a lot of uh, release 16 and focusing only on a new radio I have three guys doing this. I think Johannes know them from 5GA meetings and probably Dino maybe from some RUN or SR2 meetings. And I also have two other guys working on this radio stuff. It's it's not just uh, doing the standardization, uh, but it's also doing the integration in the vehicle. And we also I have like two other guys doing the what I'm coming to the second point of your question on what's coming afterwards on doing um, beyond here I am messages. And I say I'm aware of about seven people for Volkswagen which are working and bringing this to the future. To the second question, what do we do after here I am? I'm actually a pretty good fan of the here I am, but I want to emphasize and um, expand it a little bit because we are starting with here I am message, but what we are seeing, what we are doing at Etsy and working group one, we are cooperation for us, it's data sharing. And we start by seeing, saying, here I am and driving that fast in that direction and so on. And the next level is the vehicles we say, this is what I'm seeing. I have this sensor and I'm seeing objects there. I'm seeing pedestrians and seeing something. It might not be interesting for me as a car, as an ego vehicle to know the pedestrians on my right. But it might be very interesting for the other cars around me to know where there are pedestrians. And basically, when you start putting automation to this, you'll have vehicles saying, I'm calculating a trajectory for me because I know I'm going to navigate that way to the intersection. It's not the driver doing this, but it's basically the automated in the algorithm, the vehicle. And this information will also be shared with the other vehicles. So the other vehicles know, am I going in the intersection to go straight through, make a right turn or make a left turn? And this basically helps all the other vehicles understanding this information refine their decision algorithms because they know a lot more about what's happening outside. They also can see into the future of me. Now, automatic driving, it's now looking, I'm seeing these objects and I'm reacting to it. But if these objects can tell me what they are going to do in the five seconds, I can do my five second plan according to this. And I, I still have a, and you see on all of these points, you don't need this contract. Because getting a contract, it's an, um, you have to do some negotiation for getting a contract. And when you are driving, 100 miles towards each other, you don't really have so much time to make a contact. You really need some very straightforward rules like right for link, uh, right before left or round robin principle, something like this. And that's why, at least in my understanding and my philosophy, which I'm pushing forward with the guys working, uh, and this is expanding this here I am to here I am, this is here at what I'm seeing, and here are my plans for the future. Okay, but and I think at CTC, ITS is doing a lot of great work in this. But the extension of the applications of Here I Am is not related to the bearer protocol no. and will apply whether it's using um, yes. CV2X or SRC. My question is really go back on the bearer protocol, the big new thing on the mm -hmm. bear protocol being worked on in the um, IEEE. IEEE, what's happening for moving the 802.11p to the next generation that we'll have at the bear protocol peer-to-peer um, -peer communications? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so I, I just to address two aspects. So in IEEE, in the BD group, there's about 60 people that are working. But I would like to uh, uh, address another aspect, which is the spectrum. And for all those great things to happen, there is a need for more spectrum. So today we use only 10 megahertz. So this is why we need uh, Eddie's help to assure us and help to give us uh, more spectrum for those, those use cases. And I think one of the problems in spectrum split and this discussion that you might waste spectrum in an inefficient way because spectrum is a very scarce resource and it should be treated with a lot of uh, respect. So you cannot uh, repeat. So actually we need to show enough spectrum, both in US in the FCC discussion now about Wi-Fi sharing and 
Uh, that, that has to be concluded by FCC to understand how much spectrum is really available for uh, uh, ITS. And then in Europe, we need to assure, to assure a lot of spectrum. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're just about out of time. Can I add a little um, So, please, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I'm not going to speak for uh, regulators of standard, of standard bodies, but uh, just to tell you that Venium has been thinking of video X technologies beyond safety for the past seven years. And, in fact, uh, we have... Uh, uh, commercial networks uh, in operation doing peer-to-peer -peer communication and not just uh, here I am actually transferring data between vehicles disseminating uh, software updates uh, between vehicles and even offering uh, Wi-Fi access uh, inside public transportation using a combination of V2X technologies cellular and uh, and Wi-Fi so the technology is there it's possible to do it it's just uh, we need to move faster on the, um, the standardization of these technologies, I guess. Okay, Eddie, you want to have a last word? No. Okay. <laughs> Michael, you've been pretty quiet down there at the end. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I can also comment on the on the 3GPP activities. So it, it has been, or it will be decided at the next plenary that actually uh, a unicast and the group cast uh, component will be standardized as, as part of the, of the PC5. Uh, into in, in order to enable this this peer to peer communication, uh, when it comes to Dino's estimates of the people that are active, it's it's, it's hard to provide any numbers. I I, uh, I would say that twenty is is probably underestimated if I just look at the resources that we spend, and I I would expect that that uh, other companies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, 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 agree, I agree with you. So twenty is is uh, is highly underestimated. Okay. Only, and it was also only round one. Uh -huh. Exactly. Three GPP. There is SA two the architecture group. There is the run two the protocol group. Run three. There's so many. If it, okay. Even if it was okay. twenty per working group, we will have much more. But anyway, that's. Uh, that's since you asked, Ross, I think all of these demonstrate, and I got a little bit lost, I have to say, but uh, all of this demonstrates that all of these guys need to work together to solve all of these things. You shouldn't have six or seven fora to do that in. You need to concentrate that. So that's why I the focus on Etsy, IEEE, uh, um, um, you know, some of them need to work. On the spectrum, as you said, it's a scarce resource. So this, the spectrum that you have, you'll have to deal with. Yeah, Eddie, I can say that the U.S., finally U.S. DOT at the top level does recognize that the industry has to work together. And there are very strong efforts, including Toyota and GM, um, who are having discussions at the executive level, not the technical level, to see if they can get a resolution. So we'll, we'll wait and see over the next few months what will happen. So I think we've really hit the end of the time. Um, we got a coffee break. We can continue discussions on the coffee break. And I really appreciate everybody's efforts on this. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ross, for the panel, for this coffee break. Coffee break, uh, 30 minutes. Please be back at 11.40 sharp. We will then continue with... Uh, and presentation on ITU activities. And thanks to Degra, RoboCare, and Qualcomm for providing this coffee break. Great. <laughs> <laughs>